We're looking at questions that relate to atomic concepts from the 2015 New York State Chemistry Regents exams. So let's take a look. I already started to underline down here. It says show a numerical setup for calculating the atomic mass of potassium. Remember, after the multiple choice of the test, the short answer questions, you might get information above that pertains to not just this question, but you'll notice I X'd out questions above it. The reason why I did that is I'm trying to group things by topic so you see where questions are repeating themselves. An atomic mass determination type question, which number one is here, shows up all the time on the Regents exam, either a short answer, just like here, or in multiple choice. So let's take a look. All right, when you do an atomic mass for any element, it is what's called a weighted average. I can't just take the masses here on this table for potassium and add them up and divide by three because in nature they don't show up that way. I need to go ahead and put in based on the percent of time that they're found in nature. So what I did over here is I came up with an equation. This equation is not on reference table T, but this equation will get you a correct setup every time. If you have a different way to do it and you're comfortable with it, your teacher taught you, don't change it. But if you struggle with this question and it's probably going to show up again because it seems to show up all the time, then maybe now is the time to do something different. So let me show you how to use it. Okay, so in this case with potassium, we have three isotopes. So we're going to have three parts. And the, what, what you do here is, so it's just the average atomic mass. I'm just going to put AAM, or AAM mass, is equal to the atomic mass of isotope 1 is my 38.96. I'm going to multiply that by the percent, which is 93.26, but over 100, because we would have to take it out of percent, but I'm leaving it. I don't want to mess anything up, and then I need to add the next part. Isotope 2 here is for potassium 40, but it is given as 39.96, and that's times 0 0.01 over 100, because the percent was 0 0.01, plus, and in this case, see the dot, dot, dot up here? You just keep adding the pieces for however many uh, different isotopes you have. So the third one here for potassium 41 is 40.96. And I'm going to multiply that by my 6.73 divided by 100. And that's a correct setup. That's all they were looking for there. Let's move on to the next one. In question two, compare the mass of a proton to the mass of an electron. The mass of a proton is one AMU or one atomic mass unit for an electron. It's almost one two thousandth. Essentially, it's essentially zero for an electron. Those are just facts. You just need to know them. So what are you going to say? You're going to say that the mass of a proton is greater than the mass of an electron. Move on to number three. Now, three is kind of interesting. I haven't seen a question like this very often, so let's just take a look. In nature, we have 1.07% of the atoms in a carbon sample that are carbon-13 atoms. In the space provided in your answer book, let's show a numerical setup. So once again, numerical setup. It doesn't mean you're calculating the answer. They just want to see the setup for calculating the number of carbon-13 atoms in a sample containing 3.28 times 10 to the 24th atoms of carbon. All right, well, what do we know about percent? We know percent is the part over the whole thing times 100. This equation is on reference table T, so it's just a general percent uh, equation which we can use here. So let's use it. So 1.07% is equal to, well, guess what? Our carbon-13 atoms. over the whole thing, which is my 3.28 times 10 to the 24. And don't forget, it's percent, so it's times 100. So it looks like 106 I just wrote, but it's actually 100. 
So there's a correct setup. All right, let's move on to number four. For question four, first of all, again, let me do some erasing here. There's a lot of information, right? This little reading passage here that you have to go ahead and do. And then there were some other questions which uh, pertain to other units that I went ahead and did not cross out, but I should have. So let me do that now. And we're interested here in question four. So it says, explain in terms of chemical activity why copper is a better choice than iron to make a bracelet. Well, copper is not as chemically active as iron, which is an appropriate answer. Or you could say iron oxidizes easier than copper. Again, another valid answer. But then you might be sitting there listening to me and saying, well, how am I supposed to know that? Well, that's a great question. If we take a look, the only thing I could come up with to show you here, I think to make it maybe a little bit easier for you to understand is reference table J. I have iron and iron is higher than copper on this table. So what does that mean? Iron is more active, essentially more reactive than copper. So I think if you don't know how to answer a question like that, if it's not going to come to you, that's when you want to flip through the reference tables and maybe you'll see it and go, oh, wait a minute, here it is, and answer it. This is just part one. Check out part twos for some more uh, answers and explanations.